Well, we're going to look today at what being a disciple means in this section in the gospel according to Luke, the gospel of Jesus, that is, according to Luke, we see something that looks much like a passage in Matthew 5 through 7 called the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. And this uh, does have a striking resemblance to that, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But mainly, I want to start out just with some intro for us. Let's read the first few verses, and then we're going to talk about something kind of broadly, and then we'll come back to the text. All right, let's pick it up where we left off, and that is Luke 6, 17. And he descended with them and stood on a level place. And there was a great multitude of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. And all the multitude were trying to touch him for power was coming from him and healing them all and turning his gaze on his disciples. He began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And we'll get into the other teachings that he mentioned and the blessings that he gives. We see here a very great throng, it says, of people pushing, multitudes coming. And so geographically, I want you all to, um, again, remember that the 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 land mass that we're talking about of Israel, really, if you stacked Hines, Madison, and Rankin counties on top of each other, that would be about the size of Israel. Not a really huge place. It's not that sprawling. In our minds, we may think, oh, it's big as half the United States. No, it's, it's a very small nation. And uh, Tyre and Sidon, again, if you kind of picture in your mind that narrow strip, um, the epicenter of the world, Israel, Tyre and Sidon are on the Mediterranean, on the north side, really up in Galilee, uh, north of Galilee, in Gentile country. And uh, some mistakenly think Jesus only ministered to Jews, but you can think about the Romans that were around, they got ministered to. You can think about those from Tyre and Sidon who came and were pressing in. Many received healing from him. Many were delivered from unclean demonic spirits. And so he ministered to those from there all the way down south, so from Judea and Jerusalem. So basically everybody from the whole country was coming to this place where they were. It says that after he had chosen his disciples, he had selected these 12 ordinary, common, not very notable, not very special as far as standing out in the crowd, men. But he chose them. And we talked last week about how he does extraordinary things to very ordinary people. And that should encourage all of us. It's not about us. It's about we serve an extraordinary God who can do things through a willing vessel. And he chose them. And then before he sends them out, he's going to pull them aside to speak to them. And so he goes to this place. It says he's on a level place. And so you've heard of the Sermon on the Mount that we see over in Matthew. Uh, some have called this the Sermon on the Plain. And uh, so would you like to know whether this is indeed the Sermon on the Mount, or the Sermon, a different sermon? Would you be curious about that? Well, we don't know. <laughs> so, uh, Some sources say it's the same. Some say since he was an itinerant preacher, mainly ministering in northern Israel, in Galilee, up around the Sea of Galilee, again, to give you kind of an idea of where, they, where most of his ministry was, close to his home base of Capernaum on the north shore of Galilee, um, Jesus um, ministered to... Um, these people and was really at this time in particular um, wanting to give encouragement to not only his disciples but to the masses. So I, I've got this on my notes. You can write it down if you'd like. Jesus teaches the disciples as the crowd listens in. So you can just imagine Jesus and the power, the patience, the peace that he had in his own heart, that he's being just pressed from every side. 
and people just shouting, you know, help me, me, me. And, and it says he healed them all who came and asked for healing or deliverance. And I think he's had some time. Remember, he spent like a whole evening in prayer before he chose the disciples. It's like the father was saying, you're not only going to need that for choosing the disciples, you're also going to need some time with me to prepare for this throng that's going to come and just press in on you. This Sermon on the Plain, it's also called, maybe in your Bible notes, you see it's called the Great Sermon. Um, when Jesus ministered there in Northern Galilee, he was known as, like I said, an itinerant preacher. And he, um, itinerant preachers, many times will share the same message in one town that they shared in the previous town and going to share in the next town, right? It's the same message that they, they, they bring, and, and it's, it's a good message. It's the message of, of Jesus, and Jesus is perhaps uh, here saying some things that we will see, and you've already seen in verse 20, very familiar and reminds us of the Beatitudes that we see in Matthew, right? So it's likely it is the same because uh, Mark was written first, and then Matthew borrowed from Mark, and Luke borrowed from those two. And so um, Luke abridges some things and kind of whittles them down to where Matthew gave much more detail. So it's possible it's the same. I personally don't think it is uh, just because of the timing of things, but um, really doesn't matter. But um, he is here uh, sharing some things that do look very familiar. But the key for us today is he's teaching the disciples as the crowd listens in. It says um, in Matthew 7, uh, it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. So Jesus' objective really is to make disciples from the crowd. He's got the 12 apostles. He's got these disciples. But also there are those in the crowd who have the open invitation to become closer followers of Jesus. So there's a promise to all believers. The, this, this is a promise from Matthew 11. The promise to all believers. Jesus began to speak to the crowds. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And all of us who know Jesus find comfort in that. Do we not? Come to me and I will give you rest. Then he also has a promise to the disciples. The promise to the disciples says this. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That's a lot more than just comfort and rest for a weary soul. That's authority. That's the power of God working through someone. But here's what I see in church life today. In church life today, many follow casually but they want the promises that God gives to the committed. And they're frustrated with the results. They're just kind of haphazardly following every once in a while, and they want to see those magnificent things that those who are following much more closely are seeing. For a disciple of Jesus, Jesus is the priority in everything so when things get busy or things get tight or things get pressed, Jesus doesn't get pushed off the schedule. Jesus doesn't get pushed uh, to the lower list of priorities. He is the priority for the disciple. For the casual follower, he often gets pushed to a lower place in life. So how do we become disciples? You may be wondering, would you like to know? Well, Mark answers that in chapter 8, verse 34. And he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, the multitude, if anyone wishes to come after me, in other words, to follow me more closely, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and it's sequential, and then follow me. And again, we have those who are saying, you know, I really, I want to see the power of God and have the authority and all these things that the disciples saw and all that. And yet their lives don't reflect what we just read from Mark 8, 34. They're not denying themselves. They're indulging themselves. 
They're not taking up the cross. They're taking up every cause they can think of that they think might be noble instead of following the lead of the Lord. So the, the invitation to become his disciple is open to everyone, but not everyone is willing to deny himself. Our lives as disciples are about his purpose, his plans, and his ways. So, again, another context for what we see here is that he's speaking to disciples. So, the issue of salvation is settled. This is not, he's not going to be, in other places he talks about salvation. He talks about what it means to follow him. He even talks about being born again of the Spirit. But here, he's, that, that issue is settled. And he gets into a section that looks, again, very much like the Beatitudes. So I want us to look at the Beatitudes and what that word really means. It's a strange word, one we really don't use in our normal, everyday language. It's from Latin, beatus, and beatus means blessed. So that's simply where it comes from. It's the blessed attitudes, if you will, to use our language to understand it better. All right? To be blessed is a state of existence in relationship to God in which a person is blessed from God's perspective even when he or she doesn't feel happy or isn't presently experiencing good things. Our world, and this, again, this has crept into the church. Our world says you need to take up this cause because this when you take up this cause and you stand for this and that then you will bring God's kingdom on earth and that's not at all what God said he said the kingdom of God is where is within you it's when men and women boys and girls have a transformation through the salvation that comes only through the cross of Christ and their lives are transformed and now they're living under one king one lord and they all of a sudden, that's when society changes. It doesn't happen from the outside in. It happens from the inside out. That's when, when revival happens among the people of this world, and revival happens in the church of God, we see society and culture shifting. We look at the darkness around us. I think we all need to look at the church first. We all need to look in the mirror and say, what am I doing? Am I praying for these, these things and so forth, or am I just getting mad at the world? So to be blessed doesn't mean to go around being happy and giddy all the time. Again, I'm going to read it again, because it's a state of existence in relationship to God in which a person is blessed from God's perspective. Here's the thing, church. Your situation may not change at all. But when God changes you inside, you are blessed and everything changes. Nothing's the same. You may have the same health issue. You may have the same financial crisis. You may have the same family difficulty and yet God has done something in you and all of a sudden, whoa, there's peace because the king has come to take residence, not only residence, but authority in your life. That's what changes the world. And that's when we find out what being blessed really is. Too often the church <laughs> says, oh, man, I'm so blessed. Why are you blessed? Oh, okay, I got this job or I got this thing or I got this relationship, right? Well, what if you saw someone who was just broken in church and, and, they, and they may have just gotten laid off? And they've got a financial, I mean, or the financial, and they've also got a health issue. And you sit down next to them in church and say, how you doing? And they tell you all those things. They say, but man, I'm so blessed. You're blessed? Doesn't look like you're blessed to me. I'm so blessed because I've got Jesus. I've got contentment in my heart because I know he will never fail me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And you can't buy that. You can't fake that. Being blessed is not just this artificial thing that says, I'm blessed. You know, that's kind of weird. It's God within saying, I'm here. I got you. And I'm carrying you. That's being blessed. 
Jesus gives, again, over in Matthew, we see it. We see a little encapsulated version of it here. The Beatitudes. And some have said that, uh, that you could take all the wise writings and all the brilliant philosophies of all the world and whittle them down to something just as concise as this, and it wouldn't come close to the wisdom that's found here. It's as if the Lord said, this is what you need to live abundantly. If you haven't read for homework, you can do this. If you haven't read lately, Matthew 5 through 8, go ahead and include it all. Read it. It will bless you. Matthew 5, 5 says this, those who are humble and happy because the earth will belong to them. That's the new century version in Matthew 5, 5. It's not the outward happiness that depends on circumstances. It's an inward happiness and joy and contentment that comes only from the presence and power and blessing of God. Blessed means supremely blessed, fortunate, well off. And we think, well, I'm not well off. That's kind of a financial thing. No, you're absolutely well off. Your dad is loaded, by the way. Did y'all know that? <laughs> he owns everything. He, every own, he even owns every heartbeat in your chest right now. He owns everything. And he loves you. He's your kid. You're his kid. And he's your dad. So Jesus says, you are blessed. So again, let's catch up. And he descended with them and stood on a level place. And there was a great multitude of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. And all the multitude were trying to touch him for power was coming from him and healing them all and turning his gaze on his disciples. On whom? His disciples. Remember, he's teaching the disciples as the crowd listens in. He began to say, and then he teaches them. It's almost like he is having this healing service and he interrupts it with a Bible study. <laughs> it says, all right, time out, time out. Let me teach you some things. I got a crowd here. I'm going to teach you some things about the kingdom. And he says, blessed are you who are poor. Now, I want you to get your pen and write up to the side of the word poor. Because in Matthew, we get more detail there. What he's saying is, blessed are the poor in spirit in spirit. That, that, now, again, someone can be rich, somebody can be poor and be very blessed. So it's not speaking of financial, it's speaking of in spirit. Blessed are you who are poor. One of my sources put it this way. Blessed are you who are not spiritually arrogant. You're poor in spirit. Those who are poor in spirit realize that any and all blessings are because of what God has done, not anything that you've attained on your own. Poor in spirit. Again, those who are not spiritually arrogant. It's no accident that Jesus teaches this right after choosing the disciples and before sending them out. He wants them to understand how broke they are. He sends the disciples to preach throughout the towns of Galilee. It was part of their teaching to hear and understand this message because it helped explain clearly what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. It says, blessed you who are poor, in the ancient Greek vocabulary, there are several words that can be used to describe poverty. Jesus uses the word that indicates the most severe poverty. The idea is someone who must beg for whatever they have or will get. But wait a minute, blessed by being poor? Yes, because the poor man must look to others for what he needs. 
He has no illusions about his ability to provide for himself. The poverty that Jesus had most in mind is poverty of spirit. Picture it this way. We come to Jesus as a quadriplegic with leprosy without a penny to our name. Does that help? (laughs) Untouchable, can't help ourselves, and maybe just throw in blind, deaf, and mute. We're helpless. We can't even cry for help. And he comes and he touches and he heals. The poor in spirit recognize that they have no spiritual assets. They know they are spiritually bankrupt. Poverty of spirit cannot be artificially induced by self-hatred. It comes as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and we respond to him. Everyone can start here. Someone said this, not what I have, but what I have not is the first point of contact between my soul and God. But then he says something after that. Did you see? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Those who are poor in spirit, so that they must beg, are rewarded. They receive the kingdom of God. Therefore, poverty of spirit is an absolute prerequisite for receiving the kingdom. Because as long as we keep illusions about our own spiritual resources, we will never receive from God what we absolutely need. Did y'all get that? It's an absolute prerequisite to salvation. And poverty of spirit is a prerequisite to being a disciple too. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord by faith, I need you desperately, Jesus, save me. So walk in him by faith. Lord, I need you desperately for this next step of faith, for this next day, for this crisis I'm facing. The blessing to the poor is placed first for a reason here in the list that he goes through because it puts the following commands into perspective. They cannot be fulfilled in our own strength, but only by a beggar's reliance on God's power. Verse 21. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. To hunger for righteousness. The hungry person seeks, they look for food and hope to satisfy their appetite. Their hunger drives them and gives them a single focus. Jesus describes the blessedness of those who focus on him and his righteousness like a hungry man focuses on food. Let's compare hungering for food to hungering for God. First of all, the passion is very real, just like hunger is very real. The passion in seeking for the Lord is very natural like hunger is very natural in a healthy person. If seeking after God is our primary passion, the passion is intense, just like hunger is intense. The passion can be painful, just like real hunger can cause pain. And the passion is a driving force, just like hunger can drive a man. But also, When the Lord Jesus and seeking after him is our primary passion, it's a sign of health, just like seeking for food is a sign of health. For those who have suffered through wars, in fact, um, I read of those who had been prisoners of war in World War II, and they speak of hunger that they can't describe. It's too painful even to describe but they tell you that since they were rescued from the camps, prisoner of war camps, and they lived the rest of their life, they thought inordinately about food. It had an effect on their life for the rest of their life that they thought about food a lot. When we have poverty of spirit, when we realize how poor and broken we are, we have a hunger for God and God fills us, we hunger for more. And it's kind of a paradox, isn't it? He fills us to overflowing and we want more. 
It's kind of like when you eat a big, big meal and, and you're like, I'm stuffed, I can't eat anymore. Somebody says, oh, oh there's dessert. You know, it's okay. You know, maybe it's the same with spiritually when the Lord fills us and it's so satisfying. And he says, I've got something even more for you. I want more. And there is that in us that, that the Lord blesses us with not only wanting more, but he wants to give us more. He wants to fill us to overflowing. Something else that's interesting to me there in verse 21. Blessed are you who hunger, what does it say? Now, for you shall be satisfied. Then it says, blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. In each, this is again, paradoxical. Because you hunger, you shall be filled. You weep, you shall laugh. Poor, yours is the kingdom of God. Unlimited everything. It describes a person's spiritual condition in terms of poverty, hunger, and weeping. And Jesus uses the hopeful word now. You're poor now. You will one day receive the kingdom. You're hungry now. You one day be filled. You weep now. One day you will laugh. So this hunger for righteousness is, like I said, a sign of spiritual health. Why is that? Because we look at the world around us and we see unrighteousness. And we hunger for the righteousness of God, not only in our lives, but in the world around us. There's a natural, supernatural hunger that God has put in our hearts. We see what unrighteousness has done and is currently doing in the world, right? And so we have this hunger for righteousness. It's interesting because naturally we all hunger for something. Therefore, it's very common to see seminars and conferences pop up, Christian conferences and seminars, that whet the appetite for success, that whet the appetite for wealth, for comfort, for happiness. But Jesus says, if you're going to be a disciple of mine, your hunger and thirst will be for righteousness, for righteousness in this world and in your own life. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now, I've also got written next to the word weep, I've got mourn. Anybody have that? Blessed are you who mourn now. And the weeping, the mourning, is when we see the effects of those who don't know God. And what that results in in the world that we live in for those who don't know God and the havoc that that wreaks on this world and we mourn when we see that that's a good thing Jesus wept when he saw death he wept over Jerusalem and and he he saw what unrighteousness and he saw what ungodliness had done in this world that he had made. He says, you are blessed when you mourn. You're in, you're in touch with God's heart when you mourn. That doesn't mean that we go around mourning all the time. We go around just really heavy and, you know, all depressed. That's not at all. But don't be surprised when you find that heaviness and that mourning on your heart because of the unrighteousness that's in the world. But it's also looking at the unrighteousness in ourselves, is it not? Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And all of us can testify. Maybe we're in a season now, or we've been through a season where we personally have a heaviness and have a something that we are dealing with in our own heart and in our own lives. And we're like, Lord, I need joy in the morning. I, I really, really am looking forward to that season. Know that you're blessed now. Because it says, 
Blessed are you who weep now. If, if the Lord weren't working in your heart, you wouldn't be mourning over the stuff in your heart. <laughs> if the Lord were working in your situation, you wouldn't be weeping over it. So be encouraged, because you shall laugh. That's not a if. That's not a maybe. That's a shall. That's a promise. You shall laugh. Be encouraged with that, wherever you are today. Don't listen to the enemy. Even friends in the world who are trying to tell you, well, that's just something you're going to have the rest of your life. No. Joy comes in the morning. The Lord may be taking you through a dark valley, but he will lift you out. Blessed are you. Now it gets interesting. If you've read ahead, look at this. Verse 22. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you, and cast insults at you, and spurn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. That doesn't sound very joyful, being reviled, being ostracized, being hated having insults cast at you. So, how does the world receive Jesus and his disciples? Verses 22 and 23. Not very nicely. You can um, go into pretty much any work, any workplace and talk about other world religions with openness and, and will be welcomed conversation. But you mention the name of Jesus and things go sideways. Now that doesn't have much at my work, <laughs> work here, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> and I work with a Christian ministry now, but, but I've been there and I've seen it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's because it's the name of Jesus. It's offensive. Second Timothy 3 said, And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You can say you follow any religion, but then you say, man, I love Jesus. Whoa. They will cast insults at you, ostracize you, kick you to the curb. Be glad in that day. Verse 23, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. Oh Lord, I'd like the reward now. Can we go ahead and fast forward? That'd be good. That's not what he says. He says, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Peter was, was prone to only open his mouth to change feet. And, but he said some very profound things as well. And over in John chapter 6, Jesus said to the twelve, when he was seeing persecution start to rise, he said, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know without a doubt that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter understood that even though Times might get tough. And we know Pete didn't stand during the, during the trial. Just like Jesus said, he denied him. But after that, he never did. He learned about grace. He saw perhaps that look on Jesus' face of love after he had fallen that third time in denying that he knew Jesus. 
and it broke him. And he said, never again. I'll never deny him again. Peter had learned what all of us who want to be disciples must learn. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Not deny Jesus, but deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. They're not mad at you. They're not offended by you. They're offended by the one who you carry in your heart. They're offended by the words of life and truth that convict them of sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment to come. And when you share truth with someone, even lovingly, be prepared. Because they will cast insults at you. But be encouraged with this. Not only is your reward great in heaven, but there are many times your reward will be great on earth because that person who is the most angry and the most vile and in your face the most, that's often the ones who are the greatest disciples for Jesus when he does get a hold of their hearts. So hang in there and pray for your enemies. Love them. Because they're not enemies of you. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. As were you and I. We were enemies. We were no different from those who cast the insults right now. But for the grace of God, we would still be lost in our sins. And so we are going to pause there for today. And I just want to encourage you as followers of Jesus to press in to know him as his disciple to deny yourself, take up your cross. That looks differently perhaps for each one of us. But as we press in and follow him closely, he shows up. He shows up. He is our very present help in time of need, in time of struggle, in time of heartache. He's there. So with that, let's all stand. Church, you are blessed of God. You are blessed because you're His. And the different blessings that we see and experience in our relationship with Him vary depending on what He is doing in our lives. Don't look over your shoulder at what He's doing in someone else. Seek wisdom for what He's doing in your life. Ask Him what He wants to you to do for, as the next steps in following him more closely. With that, let's pray. And Lord Jesus, we do want to say thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you, God, that you never, ever forsake us. You will never leave us. Thank you, God, that you have given us yourself through the precious Holy Spirit And while we are in the fields planting seeds, preparing for the harvest of souls that you have in mind, while we are in the middle of struggles, Lord, remind us how blessed we are. Remind us that we are poor beyond the most severe poverty. And you have made us kings and priests of God, princes and princesses in the royal court to carry out the love and grace to the world around us. And Lord, to see your kingdom come in us and your will be done in us as it is in heaven. So Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. 
Thank you for this fellowship of believers who love you, Jesus, who love your word. Keep us all till we meet again. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.